So the title of my presentation is actually Native Habitats. I'm going to talk some about wildflowers, but let me explain why it's not just about wildflowers. If you plant a pollinator garden or plant wildflowers, you will get pollinators, you'll get bees and butterflies, and they'll come and have a snack, but then they'll move on because you haven't provided them a home. They need a place to live. You, by providing a habitat, you're providing something sustainable. So you provide a place for them to live, to raise their young, a place that they'll find food and food for their young. And that's a sustainable heart habitat. So this is a quote by Doug Tallamy. Um, I really take this to heart because we are losing so many species because we've taken away their land, we've taken away their homes, we've taken away their food. So our ecosystem is being challenged. We have replaced their homes with houses, roads, schools, shopping centers, golf courses. But what have we done for the natives? So when the ecosystem becomes challenged, it's going to challenge us. Go ahead. Uh, first example, I'm going to talk about monarchs. I think everybody knows about the monarchs becoming endangered. We've taken away all of their, their homes. We've taken away their food. So in 1984, the University of Kansas established the Monarch Way Station Program. Has anybody heard of this program? OK. Anybody who has some soil can participate in this program. You provide resources to aid the monarchs in their migration. So you need about 100 square feet for this to be effective. You need to have six to eight hours of sunlight so your plants will thrive. And you'll plant several kinds of plants to help the monarchs. Next slide. First, you'll need native milkweed. There are over 20 different species of native milkweeds in Florida. These are the three that you're most likely to find at a native plant nursery. Pink swamp milkweed and white swamp milkweed both like a, a wetter habitat. And the butterfly weed, this is my new favorite plant, has a beautiful orange flower and has, makes a thick, bushy plant. So that's also a really good support for the monarchs. Right, next slide. Please do not plant tropical milkweed. This is the one that the big box stores label as butterfly milkweed. But if you look at the scientific name, Asclepias curasabica, that is the tropical milkweed. And the problem is, you probably know, when you buy plants from the big box stores, they may have been treated with pesticides, neonicotinoids. These are systemic. They go into the leaves and the stems of the plant. You can't just take it home and wash it off. It stays in the plant for up to like six months, and it kills insects. Second reason is these plants are infected with OE. This is a protozoan parasite. The butterflies that feed on it, the caterpillars, become infected. Caterpillars will then pupate, but the adults may never emerge, or if they emerge, they are weakened or have deformed wings. The next reason is tropical milkweed does not go dormant in the winter. Our native milkweeds go dormant. When it goes dormant in November, that's a signal to the monarchs it's time to migrate. So since this does not go dormant, the butterflies do not migrate, they stay, they continue to eat on it, and that just is not a natural process for them. Plus, the longer they're eating on it, the greater the chance that they'll become infected with the OE. And then the last thing is there is a toxin present in this milkweed. Next one. Uh, the next thing you have to provide are nectar plants, and you want plants that are gonna bloom spring, summer, and fall. There's a lot of really good choices for nectar plants. And these are a few examples. The coneflower, here's a picture of one with two monarch butterflies on it. There is the porterweed. It attracts many other kinds of butterflies, not just monarchs. And the porterweed is actually 
edible. You can make a tea from its leaves. Uh, the third plant up there is a bee balm, which is starting to bloom right now. You also need to plant, um, plant things that are going to bloom in the fall, and the aster and the goldenrod are good fall bloomers. Blanket flower, ironweed, good nectar plants. You can mix in some annuals with that, like uh, zinnias. Those are very attractive to butterflies. Next slide. Then the third thing you need to provide is shelter. They need a place to hide from their predators, place to shelter from wind and rain. So you can plant some grasses, you can plant some small shrubs, and then also leave like the sticks and the dead twigs, because sometimes they'll form a chrysalis right there for you. Next slide. Another nice thing to do is to make a puddler. Butterflies get water by sitting on wet soil and sipping off the soil. That also provides minerals for them. So you can make a little puddler for them. And all this is is a shallow saucer that you set in the ground, put some sand in it and some soil, and when you water your plants, water the puddler. And you'll see butterflies come and sip water off of this. Bees can also get water off of this. Next slide. Then after you've done that, you can go online, and the website is monarchwatch.org, and register your um, Monarch Way Station. And when you do, you'll get a nice certificate like this. And you can purchase a sign like this to label your garden so your neighbors can see what you have. You can put a Monarch Way Station at a church, at a school, in your community garden, in your front yard. This is one of the first things I did in my front yard, because I wanted my neighbors to understand why I had all these crazy plants all around. And they saw this sign and they thought, this is great. Next. Oh, also, when you go on that website, you'll see that there are over 40,000 way stations now in the United States, and that little map show the location of all those way stations. And you'll see a giant spreadsheet that has a listing of all the way stations and who put that in and what the location is. And it's really exciting to me to see how this program has grown to try to help the monarchs. So, that was it, yeah. So here are some of the um, butterflies that we've seen at Vista because we provided all of these plants. Uh, the swallowtail, the host plant for the swallowtail is the parsley, the fennel, the dill. This is zebra longwing, and its host plant is the uh, passion flower. And I don't know if you can see this, but this is a common buckeye, and it's on the mulch, and it is puddling. And I know it's called common buckeye, but it's the first time I've ever seen a buckeye. <laughs> um, and its host plant, we have several of them. The, Hammock twin flower, the wild petunia, and the porter weed. We also have host plants for sulfurs and uh, skippers. This monarch emerged one day when I was at the garden, and so I was able to hold it in my hand. It was really nice. Next slide. So this is what the uh, monarch way station at Vista looks like. We have a large fire bush in the center, and then all these plants all around all kind of grown and filled in. So this is one type of habitat. But we can't just be worried about saving monarchs. We have to worry about saving all the other species that are declining. The bees, our birds, our bats. And so we make a difference by planting a habitat and practicing conservation. So you probably wonder, well, what can I do? So, my theory is you have to start small. Okay. This is another quote by Doug Tallamy. Currently in the United States, we have 40 million acres that are nothing but lawns. And he proposes that we each replace half of our lawn with native plants. And then we'll have established our own native, our own national park that's nine times bigger than Yellowstone. So just start small. Go ahead. Lawns, we know how wasteful lawns are, and we know they're not native, and they waste water, they use fertilizer. So instead of having lawns, plant a native ground cover. 
And I have all four of these ground covers at my yard. We also have them at Vista. They all provide nectar, and they all are host plants. This is Hemic Twin Flower, this is Creeping Sage, this is Frog Fruit, and this is uh, Sunshine Mimosa. Next slide. Remove, your, remove any invasive plants, things like Brazilian pepper and scum vine, very invasive. Here we're, we are removing elephant ear at Vista. This is uh, Mexican petunia, and I can't believe stores still sell this. It is very invasive. I had it in my yard. It took me a year to get all the roots dug out. This website, fleppc.org, will give you a listing of all the invasive plants in Florida, and it's constantly updated because we keep getting more plants listed as invasive. Next slide. Plant a native tree. Trees provide nesting for birds, but they also provide food and protection for insects. So these are some of the trees we planted at Vista. This is a red maple. It's a host plant for several species of moths. We haven't talked about moths yet. Moths are a very important pollinator, but they do it at night, so we don't think about them so much. But it's very important to um, have host plants for them also. This is longleaf pine. It's the host for an imperial moth. We also planted winged elm, uh, some native hollies. We planted three flatwoods plums. Flatwoods plums are host to the eastern tiger swallowtail, and in the spring they provide a lot of pollen for the bees. Okay, next slide. Here we have here we have some uh, native uh, shrubs that you can plant. First one is the shiny coffee. It gets covered with white flowers in the spring. The bees just go crazy over it. And then this time of year, it's getting berries, which are food for the birds. This is beauty berry. I think you've all seen this. Again, it provides pollen, and now it's providing food for birds and for deer. The firebush, sorry, firebush, provides pollen, and it's also the host for Host for a couple different um, moths and attracts hummingbirds. The beautyberry is host to the hummingbird moth. Next slide. Oh, now I'm going to get into the wildflower part. So these are some more wildflowers that we've planted at Vista. A lot of them are host plants, they all provide nectar. Red swamp milkweed. Coreopsis is our state wildflower. It reseeds, it's an annual, so you're going to have to make sure you don't put too much mulch on it so it'll reseed. Blanket flower, same thing, it's an annual, it's going to reseed. Spider board, it's very attractive to bees. Next slide. Yellow canna is the host for the Brazilian skipper. And what the caterpillar will do is take a leaf and fold it over, and then it'll pupate inside that leaf. And there's also some dragonfly larvae, same thing. Tropical sage is a great pollinator plant, also attracts hummingbirds. Uh, you should, if you were lucky enough, you got a swag bag with some seeds that were collected at Vista. Those are your um, future tropical sages. Wild petunia, it, oh, this is like my second favorite plant. It has beautiful lavender flowers. And it will spread. It will like throw its seed like 10 feet away. You'll have a plant here and you'll end up with one over there. It is the host plant for the buckeye. Uh, next slide. Now these are some plants that like a wet area. Spotted water hemlock. This is what it looks like in the spring. It's about six foot tall, has covered with white flowers. It'll have bees and butterflies all over it. The next is marshmallow. This one. Then we have a purple love grass that's starting to get its purple fluorescence this time of year. And then the scarlet hibiscus. It really likes to be in water. And it's also attractive to hummingbirds. Next slide. Beach verbena is an endangered plant. Plant that in your yard and your HOA can never tell you to remove it because it's endangered. <laughs> Another tropical sage, this one's a more of a pink color. You can get them in white, pink, and red. 
And Black Eyed Susan is another self seeder. Next slide. Oh, more, more plants. Florida Green Eyes. I like this plant too. Okay, this will be my third favorite plant because it smells like chocolate. Yeah. Blue mist flower just gets tiny little blue flowers, but it will bloom all spring, summer, and fall. And then Pine and Lantana, this one has yellow and orange flowers. That is the native. The Lantana they sell in the stores will be multicolored pink, yellow, orange. That isn't actually an invasive Lantana. You don't want to plant that. Next one. Okay, so now more little things you can do. I call this conservation up close. The moss, we talked about that, how they're outside at night. So turn off your lights, or put in a motion detector light. Or they also have those light bulbs that have the yellow, and the insects don't see the yellow light, so use those instead. Birds, if you want to attract them to your yard, put in a, a bird bath or a pond. But if you really want to attract them, put in a fountain or a bubble, and then they'll really come. Native bees. But they are fascinating to me. They do not live in hives. They are solitary. They make their homes in the ground. And so you need to leave some soil exposed so they can get into the ground for their homes. And um, they can't do that in lawns. And then this is a bee hotel. It has five different sizes of holes drilled in it. It's just a block of wood, five different sizes of holes drilled in it. Bee will go into that hole leave some pollen, leave an egg, and it'll mud over the hole. The larvae emerges, eats the pollen, will go through all of its developmental stages, and then come out, emerge as an adult bee. It's really cool. Next slide. A couple more things. If you really want to have caterpillars, make them a good habitat. When the leaves fall off your trees, leave them under the flower beds, leave them under the trees, Leave some twigs, a rock, a log. These are great places for them to pupate. And then, of course, do not spray insecticides. You're just going to kill them. If you're worried about mosquitoes, put up a bat house like this. A bat will eat thousands of mosquitoes every night. You can also build mosquito traps. And all this is is a bucket of water. You put some old straw or hay in it and sit it in the sun. And the mosquito will come and lay their eggs in it, and then you put one of those mosquito dunks in it. You know what those are? It has BT. You put that in, and you're going to kill all those mosquitoes. So without even spraying, you've killed a whole bunch of mosquitoes. What a deal. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, these are some websites that have good information. The first two have information about different wildflowers, native plants, if you need, you know, information on what, what grows in sun, shade, wet, dry, those are good information. Here's the Monarch Way Station website. F-A-N-N -N will give you the um, native nurseries in all of Florida, and you can find one close to you. And then there's, here's a VISTA website. You want to visit us? Last slide. And these are some of the books I use for references. Um, really good information about habitats and nature. And this is Florida wildflowers. And if you don't get enough wildflowers in that book, you can get this book. It's even more. Thank you. OK. So hello, everyone. My name is Will Stone. I work with Community Gardens and Irrigation at uh, Extension. I have a short presentation about the various materials used to build uh, raised garden beds and the health risks those materials present. Uh, the information I am going to focus on includes some of the more popular treatments for wood, cinder blocks, polymer-based deck boards, galvanized metals. Um, at the end, I'll have a slide with my contact information. So before we get into that, though, I would like to talk about the three major exposure pathways. They are inhalation, ingestion, and thermal contact. Uh, while gardening, we deal with all three. And uh, really, I'll be focusing mostly on surface soils, plants, surface water, and their interactions with the soil. Um, an argument could be made for uh, potable water, but I don't, I'm not going to get too far into that. It's a deep one. 
Um, many people are concerned about chemicals leaching from the various materials into the soil and how they can eventually make their way into the plant roots where they can be absorbed into the produce itself. Um, it's, if not the actual crop, they can easily be ingested uh, just from like not cleaning the goods or, you know, like biting your fingernails after you've not washed your hands well enough. That's a problem I have. Um, but uh, I don't know, have any of you guys ever looked into phytoremediation at all? It's a uh, pretty interesting science. It's um, the use of plants to clean up contaminated environments. Um, plants can help clean up many types of contaminants, including metals, pesticides, oils, and even explosives in some cases. So, um, Certain plants are able to remove or uh, break down harmful chemicals from the ground when their roots take in the water and nutrients from the contaminated soil, sediment, or groundwater. Plants can help clean up the contaminants as deep as their roots can reach using natural processes to store the contaminants in the root stems or leaves, convert them to uh, less harmful chemicals within the plant or uh, more commonly the root zone. Uh, convert them into the into vapors, which then are released into the air, or sorb or uh, like stick the contaminants onto their roots, where very small organisms called microbes that live in the soil break down those contaminants into lesser harmful chemicals. Um, telling you this because I want you to know how important it is to know the history of your soil. Um, not only do you need to be aware of it when you're using uh, materials for your beds, but you know because. Not only can beds leach chemicals into the soil, but if you start with bad soil, you know, you're already there. So, it's very important to wash your hands <laughs> and your produce through, right? Some go so far as to keep all their garden clothes separate from the rest. Um, it's extra important to teach the benefits of cleanliness to the youth who are much more likely to consume soils. Uh, personally, I just wash my hands a lot and schooled myself for not wearing gloves enough. Um, all right, cinder blocks. You see them often, they're everywhere. Easily attained, they last a long time, they look okay. Um, personally, I use them and like them, but there is some information about them you should know. Okay, first, if you're walking, working with cinder blocks or a concrete block, you, you gotta know the difference, all right? A lot of people label them all the same, but there's huge difference, okay? Concrete blocks are made from Portland cement and aggregate stone, while cinder blocks are made from Portland cement, cement and fly or cinder ash. Okay, so ash, fly ash, it lightens the block while still maintaining the strength. But, you know, there are a whole slew of fun things that go along with that. We'll get into that in a second. But an easy way to tell the difference, your average cinder block weighs about 35 pounds. Concrete block, it's going to weigh a lot more. So, Cinder ash. This is a simplified version of a power station, sort of like our own Big Bang station, you know, coal burning power. Uh, the main reason people are uncomfortable with cinder blocks in the garden is that they are often made with fly ash or cinder ash, which is a byproduct of the coal burning electric power plant. Fly ash is a fine particle that floats up the stack, caught by the pollution control apparatus, while the coarse material is found at the bottom of the burn or the furnace, referred to as bottom ash or cinder ash. Okay, so according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, depending on where the coal is mined, coal ash typically contains heavy metals including arsenic, lead, mercury, cadmium, chromium, selenium, as well as aluminum, barium, beryllium, boron, chlorine, cobalt, manganese. <laughs> Nickel, thallium, <laughs> vanadium, and zinc, plus some others that I couldn't predict. <laughs> okay, if eaten, drunk, or inhaled, these toxins, toxins can cause cancer and uh, nervous system impacts such as cognitive defects, developmental displays, and behavioral problems. They can also cause heart damage, lung, damage, lung disease, respiratory stress, kidney disease, reproductive, reproductive problems, gastrointestinal illness, birth defects, and impaired bone growth in children. Okay, this is all really frightening, I'm sorry, but if you really think about what could potentially le leach out of the 16 blocks it takes to make a four-bay bed, maybe it's not as bad as I'm thinking about. 
Okay, it's just better safe than sorry. It's better safe than sorry. Okay, so while researching though, I was really unable to find like rock hard conclusive evidence that stated concrete block was dangerous to use the material to construct garden beds. Nor was I able to find any state or national bans on the use of them in the garden. In fact, many constituent sites still encourage their use in the garden. This is concrete. Okay? So if you're uncomfortable, you've got some blocks, and you're uncomfortable with what you got, they can be lined with water permeable plastic or like a polypropylene fabric, which is common, like weed block that you find in like big box stores. It will help, you know, prevent some of the contact with the soil. Um, but those plastics present their own problems, which we'll get into shortly. <laughs> the EPA determines product safety during, all right, pressure treated wood. Sorry, it's more bad news. The EPA determines product safety during their wood preservation registration process. The wood preservatives used in treated wood available to consumers have been registered by the EPA for general use, which means that which means that the EPA has determined uh, that there are some relatively safe uses for most, if not all, consumer applications, okay? Different people preserve safety in different ways, obviously, so if you're concerned, again, put some plastic in. Um, please note, though, um, most of the treated wood that is two inches or less in thickness tends to be treated for above ground uses only, so it may not last long, you know, in a ground contact application. I need to raise that. You can't advance. It's, it's no, 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 I'm... You're okay, okay. I just have a lot to read. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, the... So, there uh, should be contact information on the end tag of treated wood at your local retailer if you really want to grow those guys. Um, some of the older treatments that really are no longer in use are uh, really been proven hazardous to your health are chromated copper arsenic, which is CCA, creosote, and uh, pentachlorphenol, I'm going to call it penta. Um, those are the most common. Some more well-received preservatives are alkaline copper quaternary or ACQ, copper zole, CA, or copper HDO, and then copper naphthenic. Um, ACQ is water-based, has a few variations, mostly just copper and ammonium, doesn't contain any chromium or arsenic, nothing too terrible, still though beware. Okay, copper zole is an almost equal mix of copper and boric acid. Um, boric acid contains boron, some plants, you know, you need a little bit, but obviously just in high rates, not so awesome. Okay, so copper HDO is said to be a little bit safer um, due to it is uh, less likely to move through soils, but it is not allowed in any aquatic uses. So raised beds, you know, they're getting wet, probably not safe to use it. Um, it's also not intended for use in packaging of food, feed, or in the construction of beehives. Okay, so copper, copper naphthenate is a copper salt of naphthenic acid. It's lower toxicity, makes it commonly used as a wood preservative. It is available over the counter and shows lower level of toxicity in mammals by the three major exposure pathways. All these preservatives contain copper, which will leach into the surrounding soil. If your beds are made from treated lumber, lumber it is recommended to plant at least 12 inches away from the border of your bed. An important note, chemically treated lumber is not allowed under USDA National Organic Program regulations. Um, some more naturally decay resistant woods include black locust, cypress, osage orange, red cedar, redwood, and white oak. A very important note about cypress though is it's so hard to tell that it's sourced correctly. The University of Florida does not recommend it. The logging of cypress stands here in the southeast is an unsustainable practice. They provide a habitat for wildlife, as well as filtering water, and stands that act reservoir, as reservoirs for floodwaters. The high demand for them has, income, has, has them coming down faster than they can be regrown, okay? Many stands have been replaced with pine. This is okay. So there are so few old growth stands left, that the younger cypresses of today don't have the time to grow the hardwood that gives cypress the beneficial properties that are so highly sought. So please, cypress, not the best thing. 
Um, if you're using pallets, please use the one labeled HT for heat treated. Um, you can also look for the International Plant Protection Convention logo, which is that beautiful thing there on the left. So, galvanized. All right, so a lot of people use galvanized tubs for raised beds. Uh, the process of galvanization includes coating zinc or a coating steel with molten zinc. All right, the main possibility of problems occurring is the interaction of the acidic properties with the metal. Over time, zinc and cadmium will or can leach into your soil. I'm sorry, you said they can what? Leach into the soil. Um, until the invention of modern polymers, many residential water pipes were constructed from galvanized pipes. To this day, some still feed animals and water our pasture animals with galvanized tanks. I believe that knowing the history of each container is important. So, reusing an old tub that might have once been used to mix herbicides and pesticides is a pretty questionable practice. Um, older tanks that show signs of rust should also be noted. They look awesome, but once it's rusting, it means the zinc coating has been dissolved, which would indicate it has leached into its uh, surroundings. So, but really though, I was unable to find really great research-based outcomes that specify, you know, guarding with galvanized containers is a real danger to our health. You know, it's just, you should be aware. Um, two important metals are um, zinc and cadmium. They're both considered dangerous if ingested in high amounts, even though zinc is a micronutrient that both humans and plants require. If you're worried, again, plastic line. Uh, depending on the area, well water might be acidic, uh, that water could, though, take years to break down the coating, depending on how thick the coating is. Um, municipal water has been fully treated and processed before coming out of our tap, so a little bit on the safer side. Um, raised beds made of metals can heat up quite a bit in Florida summers, even with the cooling properties of soil. Uh, consistent temperatures of soil don't stay near dangerous levels, but the corrosion rates, rates of zinc are elevated if consistent temperatures of around 158 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, polymers. This is fun. This is uh, not so much information we found on this stuff yet. But, um, so the National Library of Medicine published a paper recently stating that almost all commercially available plastic products they sample, independent of the type of resin, product, or retail source, leach chemicals, having a reliably detectable EA or estrogenic activity, including those advertised in BPA-free products. In some cases, BPA-free products release more chemicals than the EPA, the EA products did. So, when choosing your plastic boards for your, your garden bed, please be aware of the type of boards you're buying, because there are multiple mixtures. We have PVC or polyvinyl chloride, which is probably the most popular one. Um, chlorine is a large contributor to uh, the problems that arise with PVC. Um, it is often mixed with uh, phthalates, which the EPA has de deemed dangerous to human health. It has also been shown that vegetables take in and hold these phthalates, they can be leached out by the PVC. HDPE, or high density polyethylene, which is what a lot of our grow pots are actually constructed out of. Um, it's a petroleum based plastic. It, the boards tend to cost more than lumber and they're very flexible. So if you're careful, you have to be careful when you're handling it because they do bend out of shape. Um, it really helps if you're setting them as beds to uh, stake them in regular intervals. Many disposable food packaging, like milk jugs or Tupperware, are made from this. Um, and a lot of websites I found claim that it's a chemically inert substance, which would mean it won't leach into the soil. Um, still though, I don't know, be a little paranoid. Um, this is often sold as Trex deck decking at the big box stores. Um, another one you see there a lot are uh, composite lumbers, which is just wood and fibers mixed with plastic and a binding agent. So the plastics can be, you know, PVC, polyethylene, there's, the list is pretty long. Okay, so all the problems that come with composite lumber also come with, you know, all the other plastics. 
Um, this is just a handy chart that kind of gives a little bit more information into that. If anyone wants that, I have a slide at the end with my information. I'll gladly mail any of this stuff to you guys. Um, EVA or PEVA is a uh, newer plastic that's been coming into use lately. It's considered biodegradable and is also chlorine free. It is a softer product though, so you can't add those long running boards. Um, but there are many smaller tubs that are commercially available. Um, it's used more for things like shower curtains and you know, car covers and things like that. Um, I really wasn't able to find too many in information or studies about the dangers of this plastic yet, but I would expect to see a lot more of this coming in, in the next couple of years. Um, so in conclusion, uh, the concerns I have brought to you here today are in no way meant to stop you from container gardening. I know I'm kind of a downer. Um, <laughs> is that you take the information presented and ask yourself questions that arrive at knowledgeable, competent, and optimistic conclusions. Um, even though the probability of coming across dangerous levels of contaminants is low, we should still strive to reduce any possibility of harm to ourselves, others, and our planet. If you are uncomfortable with the information I presented, I'm sorry, consider road problem. Um, just be no, just be sure to know the soil composition you are working with before you dig. Simple steps to reduce exposures are always wash your hands after dealing with soils. This is very important for children. Uh, wash your vegetables, peel your root vegetables, always remove the older outer leaves from leafy vegetables, and mulch to reduce airborne particles, and obviously amend with compost. Okay, the important thing, don't stop that. I just threw away every single pot at my garden, every single piece of wood. I don't, okay, well, so you're gonna have to tell us what we can use, okay? Nothing at least would be shorter, just, just a little bit. So, the next person up actually needs no introduction. Um, I think we all know who he is, and um, we love him for what he does. He needs Talk about the worm bin, 
what it can do for you in your garden, um, at your house, um, and why I like this. Um, this is scalable. So essentially, you could start with this, and the colony of worms that are in here will slowly grow over time. And you can actually bud off of that colony and very easily duplicate this and make another one. So one of the biggest mistakes I see people make with their worm farm is they treat it like a garbage can. So they get their worm farm and they just start dumping all their vegetable scraps in it. This is a pet. <laughs> You're feeding it. You don't just go home and dump more food in your dog bowl. You wait for the dog to eat the food and then you give it more. Once you start learning how much your worm bin will consume, you can probably figure out, oh, I'm going to need six of these, you know, if I want to actually compost all of my uh, veggie scraps. Whether or not you're doing vermicomposting or regular composting, one of the things I, I uh, ask people to ask themselves is why are you composting? I think that is an important question to answer because it might determine which form of composting you're going to gravitate toward. So, for example, you run a juice bar and you just have a ton of vegetable waste and fruit waste that you're trying to get rid of, well, you might compost one. Um, you might just be trying to uh, produce organic fertilizer. This way is a good, composting is very good for that, um, to produce your own organic fertilizer. So if you're trying to compost mass waste, um, another one is if you're actually trying to create garden soil. So you might do another process of compost, which we're not going to get into all those uh, today. But essentially this worm bin is made out of three separate containers. The top two containers are basically identical as far as, yeah, there's going to be buggies that jump out of this. I did get rid of a lot of them, but I was like, you know, this isn't actually uh, that bad for people to see that there's going to be buggies in here because you need to be ready for that if you're going to get into this. Um, essentially, these are uh, the three containers and the top two are identical as far as where and how many holes are drilled in them. Um, basically, the, uh, there is holes drilled through the bottom and all around the side. So essentially these top two containers are like a column. Okay. The bottom container has a few holes, about an inch up, and then some holes on the edge. Okay. This is kind of like, uh, even though I keep this under my carport, there has been times that the lid's blown off of it and the wind blows in sideways when it's raining and, uh, and this gets filled up with water. So just having that bottom container that these are kind of sitting over with the holes in it, it actually lets it drain. Okay, the uh, holes that are in the bottom of it, only on one side, which is right back here, is where your warm tea or your liquid, your leachate, can actually kind of leach out of. Um, I hold this up right now, but um, there's just all kinds of liquid in this pan that's been oozing out of this thing since I threw it in my truck today. So the liquids, uh, that can be used, uh, watered down a little bit, and used directly on your plants, and then, this was the bottom container. As you can see, there's no scraps in it. It's literally just pure worm dirt. Okay? This is usually scraped out, and now this is actually why I have these big cookie sheets. So this is actually scraped out, and I spread it out on the cookie sheets to dry out. Um, this is actually the, the worm castings. Um, this is after about, I'd say, seven or eight months of doing this. And I neglect my worm bin horribly. I do not feed it as often as I should. But basically what I would do is scrape out about 90% of this because the worms still, they like to live in their own poop, basically. So I scrape out most of this. Then I take everything out of the top container where I had been adding stuff that kind of still, you know, somewhat looks like what I've been adding. This is just a bunch of packing paper, and then this is an old uh, banana stock, some bananas on it. Uh, by the way, these uh, worm farms are actually a great place to like germinate mango seeds and stuff. There's a mango seed that's germinating right there. So I usually will put my mango seeds in and um, there's another mango plant. 
Um, so I kind of pull everything out of the top container and put it in. Again, mind you, I've harvested all of this out. Okay. Then this container becomes the top container. So I flip flop. And basically what happens is, because most of the food was in here, and there's still lots of stuff in here that I haven't finished consuming, they'll finish everything that's in here. And remember, there's holes in the bottom of both of these containers. So I'll actually move from uh, one container up until the next container. So, you know, this, this gives the opportunity, having the two containers that you flip flop, it gives the opportunity for them to finish everything off. Because if you only have one container and you just keep adding to it, it's going to always look like this. And the worm dirt's going to be kind of at the bottom. I know some people do it that way, they would mix it up. I never mix this up. Um, so if you actually want your worm dirt, um, you know, to look finished, like this is, all these little things crawling around in here. Um, you you want to be able to do that. You want to have a container that you've literally stopped adding to. Um, I actually do not force water through this anymore. I used to, uh, to kind of force out the worm tea. And I found that it makes it very difficult to balance your worm bin because it, it, it gets way too wet. So I actually just kind of take what it gives me. Um, at home, this sits on top of center blocks. That's why there's like a little dent in it right there. It sits on top of center blocks like that. And I have a, um, a container underneath it. So the stuff just kind of drips out. So I just kind of take what it gives me, because what I'm really after is this stuff right here. Yeah. I'm really after this stuff. Um, but I don't add any, uh, you know, meats, cheeses, breads, processed foods, anything like that. It's just literally our fruit and veggie scraps. I used to be crazy with these things and like shred up all the paper and be really careful with it. Now I just put my paper bags in here and like paper packing material, I just throw it right in there. It seems to be just fine. Um, but for the most part, you know, this is how right here it's sitting. This is how it sits at my house. These are beetles, by the way. Um, it will actually kind of self-regulate depending on how much you feed it. Um, if I was actually going to, um, so if I find out a school wants a worm bed, I'll start like getting really religious about feeding it, putting all of our coffee grounds in here and all of our, our kitchen scraps, checking it regularly, making sure that they're eating it at the proper intervals and really push the colony to, um, to, to multiply. And then I can kind of bud off of this and make another one uh, for them. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, it is, uh, I mean, I, I neglect this. I, you see how much food's in here right now. You can put so much more in these right now. But like I said, key thing is, this is not going to be your composting system where you're going to eliminate your waste stream at home or at your community garden. These are strictly to produce, you know, a, a, a a manure you can handle um, and, and be able to put out into your garden. So, worms are animals, so essentially you have a manure producing animal right at your fingertips. Um, so, these are, yeah, so these are actually European red wigglers. Um, and again, without going deep down that rabbit hole, um, these aren't the same worms you would find at the bait shop. Oh, okay. Okay? Most of what you'll find at the bait shop is one of about three or four different types of worms, all of which are types of earthworms. When they get too hot or too cold, they like to dig down and find a level that they're comfortable. So they go up and down and up and down and up and down, um, <clears throat> which makes them great in the garden. So if you're doing like a big composting system, um, they're really good to put in there. If you want to do intensive small container vermicomposting, you need to get these where they're from. They actually only live in the top few inches of the forest floor, and they actually consume the fresh stuff. So most of the worms you would find at the bait store, they actually have to wait for the stuff to kind of break down a little bit, and what they're actually really going for are different microbes and little protozoas and things that live in the soil and some de uh, decomposing food scraps. These guys right here actually have a raspy tongue, like a cat, and they will actually go and eat this fresh banana peel right here. Like that is their food. 
So you'll find them kind of gathered around the freshest stuff that you put in here. How many worms are couldn't even tell you. <laughs> I do know that each of these worms can eat about three times their body weight per day. Um, I mean, if I had to estimate, I'd say anywhere between about 250 and 3,000. Well, you have to. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were going to start this, how many worms would you get to start with? That's from scratch. Gotcha. Right, right. It's actually better to start with less and let your colony build up into the container that you have. So I think most of the time, if you go, you know, buy them on the internet, um, you can give them like 250, 500, or 1,000. I would get the 250. So start small, um, and then kind of let it build up. It's really, really important though, when you're starting out, that you maintain a decent moisture level with your bedding, and you do not add dirt. These worms do not like dirt. They don't want to be in dirt. They want to be in organic matter and in their own poop. <laughs> That is what they live in. They do not want to live in dirt. They do not like dirt. It, the, the sand particles in the dirt will actually harm them, and they will leave your worm room. So, like I was saying, these guys live in the top couple inches of the forest floor, so they're really, really good with immediate and sharp environmental spikes. Like, that's, that's what they're good at. This thing gets too, too hot or too, too cold. Um, they're going to be fine. But when I am starting worm bin out, there wasn't one in here, as you can see. But when I am starting a new worm bin out, I do put some bricks in here. And I keep the bricks wet. And essentially that's like their toy. So if, 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 um, if I put the worm bin in the wrong spot and I go out there in the morning sun's really blasting on it, I'll like go in there and find all the worms underneath the bricks. So it, 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 it kind of helps uh, add some uh, uh, balance to the uh, to the environmental changes. If you have if you have some bricks in there, they hold moisture, they stay cool, they you know hold heat. So you know bricks will kind of slow down from from changing too quick. Question, the question over. Yes. Well, we kept our pets for over eight years, and they traveled in with us in the car from Florida to New York City. That's they they lived on Broadway with us for many many years. And and uh, I take it you're right. You have to feed them the proper amount and not overfeed. Yeah. yeah. We only used one bin system, the very right. simple one, and we kept it dry enough by letting the newspaper absorb the moisture. You have to get then, the right amount. Then we would right. take the wet newspaper out and lay around on the garden. It's excellent. But uh, they are pets, and you should not overfeed them. I think that's it. so. Essentially, they like. They want to be in the same environment that you want to be in. So if you open up your worm bin and it smells good to you, they're happy. Right. Okay? If it stinks, they're not happy. Too much moisture. Okay? So what, what's actually happening, you know, they, they literally live in the same type of oxygenated environment that we live in. And so what happens is if you don't have a, like an oxygen positive environment for them and your food starts putrefying um, and it starts going anaerobic, Anaerobic bacteria uh, has a very uh, interesting secret weapon, um, and that's they produce a gas that's ammonia based. Uh, ammonia is really good at bonding with oxygen that's in the air, so it actually will steal the oxygen from the aerobic bacteria. And that ammonia based um, smell, or that, that stink that you smell, is that ammonia based gas coming off your stuff. So, having good airflow, that's why I have lots of holes around in the side of this. Um, if I ever did feel like I overfed it, I actually will just leave the top kind of off of it like that. I'll come in, I'll mix up what's in there, and just kind of air it out. So it's really, really important. Yeah, what we did was get a lot of holes around the top, and we had two pipes with slits in it, and we have the paper there, and you feed each corner. Yeah. Well, and you get to know how much after yeah. having a couple months not to overfeed it. And I go with my brother in, in, in Westchester, was, I was visiting people for a couple of weeks. I knew how much newspaper and stuff to put, not wet it too much, and the ones would be happy when I arrived back a month later. But that takes a lot of practice and getting yes, to know, absolutely. You know what. And it didn't smell at all when you get it down. We kept it in our apartment uh, on, in, in Manhattan. But my, my brother, other people thought I was crazy. So, do y'all see how wet this is? I, I did not wet this. So once it's established, it is kind of self-regulated. So I mean, I think I put this stuff in here like two days ago, 
and it basically, you look, you know, it, it basically like rains in here every day. Um, so, so it is self-regulating. Setting them up initially, that's the hard part. You want to keep any paper that you have in there basically as damp as a wrung out sponge. So you want to, you want to touch it and know that you touch something wet. Maybe even like hold it up and someone say, yeah, that's wet. But you cannot bring any water out of that paper. That's how wet it needs to be. And a great project for kids. A great project for kids. I got the brownies. Brownies on our, our community garden. And we brought the worm in. I spread it out on picnic tables. And I told the kids, you got to separate this worm poop from, you know, from the, the paper. And these kids put gloves on. And they went to town. And the parents were like shocked. They were all separating the poop from the worm. And Kathy wanted to take those worms. So that's the nice thing about the multiple blend system is yeah. I don't have to do that. Um, and, and when I spread that, the worm castings out on this big tray, um, a lot of times that's when I'll kind of find whatever last few worms are in there. But by the time it looks like this, they're going for the fresh food. Almost all of them have migrated up to the top. Yeah. So I'm not sep even separating worms from worm castings either. Yeah. Thank you, David. Any last questions?